And I think it's a really important part. Uh, the work that I was doing in my um, PhD dissertation was specifically about the translation of climate science by the media into public discourses and the shortcomings and uh, the pluses, the minuses, uh, without prejudicing it too much. So today's talk is specifically about the media, and it's important to get um, your PowerPoint thing to work. <laughs> Aha, let's try, nope. Oh, there it goes. There we go, there we go. So it's important to understand what journalism is and how the media functions. And uh, there's an adage in when we talk about media or medium, it's called a medium because it's rarely well done. And that, that is said with tongue firmly planted in cheek, but there's also a great deal of truth to it when it comes to the sciences. So the history, understanding where the media comes from uh, is really important to understanding our understanding of the climate crisis and why we have such uh, polarities within the understanding of it in the public. Um, the news media has been around since the time of Martin Luther, and it can be pretty much said with a great deal of, of confidence that when Martin Luther was nailing his 95 theses to the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, more than 500 years ago, he was actually starting the first newspaper. And this was a public news event uh, that wouldn't have been possible without a number of technological uh, occurrences that had happened over the previous 100 years. And um, uh, just to outline them briefly, uh, the first is movable type. Uh, there had been printing presses, but movable type was crucial in order to create duplicates so that you could cheaply produce something over and over again. Up until that time, you'd have to rely on uh, monks in monasteries, basically, to copy things by hand, getting a book written required scribes. And that tradition goes back to the Epic of Gilgamesh when Asher Banipal enslaved 2,000 scribes to transcri transcribe more than 2 million tablets about the Epic of Gilgamesh. So movable type was important, the printing press, but going along with that was also an alphabet. Having a limited set of characters as opposed to um, images like hieroglyphics or even something like um, uh, cuneiform where you would have up to five or 6,000 different characters to represent things. And that syllabic-based alphabet, uh, those 26 letters could be used to describe almost anything that you wanted to, descri uh, to describe in under 30 characters. And so it made it efficient for someone to be able to set up the type. And the last part of this is the technology of paper. When we discovered cellulose, cellulose allowed us to duplicate paper and to make a medium which could be imprinted with ink from these 26 characters, which, which were syllabic based as opposed to noun based or verb based. So we could construct anything we wanted to that we could um, verbalize. And to, to give you an example of this type of process, uh, when you go back to looking at the adoption of mass communications back in the mid 1800s, the king of Korea, uh, the principal language of Korea was Hangul. Um, he wanted to have a completely literate society. So he developed a limited alphabet where the alphabet itself was not only syllabic, but syllabic in the way that the shape that your mouth took to form that particular syllable. So that by reading, you could, uh, by reading the Hangul um, written word, you could actually 
hear how the spoken word would sound through your mouth because the letter formed the same shape that your mouth would form in making that particular sound. So we've come a long way. Uh, one of the deficiencies in many of the uh, Chinese, Eastern languages, Japanese, was that it would take five to 6,000 different characters in order to transcribe it, even though they had movable type and they had uh, paper, they didn't have a limited syllabic alphabet. So this whole idea came together with Martin Luther, where he was able to print out these, this news release and nail it onto the church and then pass it around to everybody. Literacy then increased dramatically in the next hundred years. The literacy is crucial for, for news because if you don't have anybody reading your news, you had to rely on people to talk to you. But being able to print the news allowed you to get your views out, allowed you to create a flow of dialogue literacy, and that fed back into the sciences. And hence, that's why I'm wearing my t-shirt today, which says science is greater than opinion. And it also allowed you to have opinion as well uh, in that. So this uh, history of journalism is quite old on one hand, it's over 500 years old. But on the other hand, in terms of the human history, if we look at written history, which has been around for roughly 7,000 years, it's kind of a recent advancement. And it's purely the result of the Renaissance and purely the result of this technology creeping into how we communicate. And, you know, this little thing doesn't like me. Aha. Let's try this. Aha. There we go. So what came out of this printing press was journalism, this uh, language, this alphabet, this paper, and the revolutionary technologies increased the literacy, which rose exponentially. At the time of Martin Luther, virtually no one other than those who were scribes could read. Even kings and queens were unlikely to read. Um, one of the tablets that Asher Banipal wrote, he was uh, 710, 720 BCE, um, was that he was literate, that he was able to transcribe things and he was able to read. And he set up the world's first library. And this um, revolutionary com uh, combination of technology is what led to... Uh, literacy and uh, it led to a new hunger that happened for communications. People came to rely on it. I, I can't start my day without a cup of coffee and some form of newspaper. It's either the Guardian or the Toronto Star or the local star or uh, the local newspaper or CBC. Literacy plays an important role in my life as a functioning person. Newspapers sprang into existence by the 1600s. These were, uh, they didn't exist before Martin Luther. And then by the 1600s, almost every major city in Europe had a newspaper. And from that, uh, newspapers were often very biased and were extensions of political organizations or those in power. From that, we had freedom of the press being formally established in Great Britain in the late 1600s. Um, the former editor of The Guardian, uh, Alan Russ Bridger, um, stated that uh, licensing of the press in Britain uh, was abolished in 1695. You couldn't be press unless you were licensed by the crown at that particular point. That was abolished by parliament so that everyone could start some form of communication. So the expansion of journalism continued. It continued right across Europe. And um, in the 1920s, they began to drop their blatant in the United States bipartisanship or partisanship in the search for new subscribers. They found that there was a limited resource if you were politically aligned in a particular way. And the ethos of journalism to, to become unbiased was started, surprisingly enough, in the era of uh, Hearst, 
who owned um, you know, the largest newspapers at that time and was widely viewed as one of the most powerful men in the world. Journalistic coverage then began to fill all aspects of human endeavor. If news was related to sports, if news was related to um, politics, religion, crime, legislation, travel, recreation, cinema, celebrity, weather, all of that became part of the news. And everything started to be shaped around this idea that there was a journalistic credo, a journalistic ethic, a set of standards by which we could communicate that. That's what the expansion led to. None of this was predicted. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 edict, or his, his thesis of the 95 uh, edicts uh, in, on the Wittenberg church, he could not have predicted what would happen any more than we could have predicted what would happen uh, when Tim Berners-Lee founded the World Wide Web in 1995, that there would be things like Facebook and Twitter and Donald Trump. Um, these things have a life of their own. Now, that is, I'm laying the, the groundwork for this to talk about the media's role with science. And this is where you have two competing methodologies that are intersecting with each, other, with each other. You have scientific method on one hand, and you have journalistic method on the other. So we're going to cover both of those. Journalistic method um, looks to simplify an event, a news event, a circumstance um, in, in the news for the average person. Newspapers are said to have a literacy a level, a level, depending on the newspaper, between grade nine and grade 11, so that it's accessible to the, the widest number of people possible, and um, television less so. Uh, television, we're looking at a literacy rate of anywhere from grade six to grade nine, uh, because it's primarily a visual and, and verbal medium. Um, and it also seeks to put its news out in a simplified method called the pyramid method. So if you went to journalism school, that'd be just about the first thing you learned. The pyramid method is you figure out what the most important thing is that you're trying to say. And you take that and that's your lead. And then every additional paragraph that comes after that lead is something that you deem to be of lesser importance. And every paragraph is to explain that particular aspect of that article. So if a journalist takes a scientific article and bases a science newspaper article on the scientific article, that journalist would look for what is the bottom line? What is this saying? and then lays out in a diminishing role, the inverted pyramid, the diminishing role of each subsequent paragraph that is viewed to be important for the average reader. In addition to, so you've, you've got a pyramid form where you lay that out. You always start with the, the headline and that's what the headline uh, editor seeks to do is to encapsulate that particular scientific news event with something that's pithy. And often it can be punny, as long as it's catchy. It's the uh, writing of headlines and newspapers is one of the most important uh, functions in, in publishing news reports. You want to be able to have someone who's very skilled with that. It's, it's almost like um, on television, the weather presenters are the most pretty. And I, I speak from experience on that. <laughs> Uh, Stuart, you were on, uh, you did weather presentate. Yes, see, uh, I, I was right. Um, but I digress. Um, so in addition to that, um, there's a pro-con presentation and this journalistic method that says, if you put out um, a particular, you wanna be as unbiased as possible. So if you're making a statement, from someone, there has to be a counter statement. That's called pro and con. And the idea is that you present the pro and you present the con and the reader or the listener or the viewer is the one that's making the decision. So you in an unbiased way 
presented. Let's say you're talking about someone who was arrested for a crime. You would get the perp walk. Then you would get a quote from the lawyer or the person who is said to have committed the crime to present a balanced news report. So that's done in all reporting in journalism, whether you're reporting sports, whether you're reporting um, human events, uh, cinema, um, you always need a, a pro and con. And so as you distill that down, you need the representation and opinions of people. And this is where it's, you can start to see a divergence between how journalism presents things and how science presents things. So you want to have someone to come in and talk to you or be quoted as to having talked to you about what is happening. And um, because of the way that's presented, the paragraphs often are not very detailed. They're single sentence paragraphs before you change the topic again. So each new topic has to have a new paragraph. And so you don't get a lot of related material in um, a science report for journalism. I forgot to click that. There we go. So um, here's where journalistic method is at odds with scientific method. Science is not pro and con. Science is about research, and science is about fitting that research into a large body of work and presenting it for review by those who are experts within that particular field. So if you're writing about um, a certain drug coming into the fore um, as, as, a, an, as an academic, you would present how you did the study, where it was done, when it was done, with all the guardrails on it. Uh, what are the error bounds? What are the uh, factors that made the study good or bad? And you would look at um, those error bounds as helping the reader not to undermine your research. Um, when a climate scientist talks about um, putting in the possibility of, of uh, CO2 being related to uh, the temperature increase in, in, uh, of the earth. Um, what you're trying to do is tell the reader how sure you are that there's a relationship between the two. So you state that it's possible, it's probable, or very likely. And if, if possible, you state percentages. The media very often interprets that to be, well, if there's a chance that it can happen, and you're only saying it's a chance, then there's a chance it won't happen. And that feeds into the pro-con nature of journalism, which doesn't really exist. That's not what the academic paper is saying. The academic paper is saying, if you look at an election, for instance, this is accurate 95 times out of 100 within 3%. And the error bounds are saying, it's not that this is inaccurate, but we have to understand that there is a chance that something else could be happening here that we haven't taken into account. Um, so science is never pro-con. It, it is actually a piece of research that fits into the body of work that scientists do, and it's reviewed by scientists and sent back to the originating authors or author and then rework for publication. And that's called peer review, which is an incredibly important aspect of scientific research. And then you look at opinions and quotes of scientists. They never come into the, st the academic study. When a scientist is doing something on um, you know, the efficacy of a new chip in a computer, they don't put their own opinions in. They just do the research. They say, this is the power that's required. This is the electricity that will go through it. This is how quickly it functions. Um, journalism would seek to have someone with an opposing opinion of that to balance it. Um, then there's the expertise of the writer. In many cases, it is viewed as um, something that gets in the way of good journalism, if you are 
biased. It, let's say you're covering po politics and you're a Democrat and you go to cover a Republican conference. You're viewed as having a bias. And it's better that you have no political standpoint uh, as far as journalistic uh, morals and ethics are concerned. Um, this is not the case with science. Um, we don't look at uh, a lack of expertise or a lack of alignment with something as being a positive thing. You do want your researchers to be deeply understanding of the particular science that they're looking at. Then there's the case of the actual expertise of the individual journalist who is covering the science. I can't think of a single um, science journalist in the region who has a principal background in science with the exception of the meteorologists. Um, and I think, um, in, in some medical cases, I think uh, John Gillis is on uh, 95.7 and he of course is um, a specialist in pain management and, and an expert in his field, but that's very rare. Generally speaking, most, um, most reporters have no background in what they're reporting. It doesn't say they don't understand it, but formally they don't have the education and certainly have not done research because research now doesn't take place until you get into your master's, or at least in some cases, fourth year, if you're specializing in, in the sciences. So most journalists do not have an expertise in science. And, and to be fair, journalistic method prefers them not to have that. So um, then there's the choice of, there is so much science happening now that when journalists or editors or publishers choose to cover a particular science, they're actually biasing the public because there is so much out there. How do they choose this? And chances are they choose it through spectacle and hyperbole. So individual, if you look at today's coverage, it is almost all about the spectacle of the fire and the human interest stories. And not to say that that's not important, but if we're talking about the fire in terms of the climate crisis, it skews the public opinion. So we send out our thoughts, we set up uh, mitigation um, to, to help people out and we focus on that. And we don't ask the important questions like, why do we have to borrow a fire bomber from Newfoundland? Why do we not have one here of our own? Um, why has the military not been called in if we're evacuating 18,000 people? Um, a, a lot of those questions aren't being asked because they're seen to be um, untoward, uh, perhaps a little harsh. And so journalistic method starts to become at odds with the science. So um, let's talk specifically uh, about climate science. So the journalistic pro-con mandates um, actually empowers contrarians. So it's, uh, there are a group of people who swim upstream and they can be within the sciences, they can be uh, from other areas, but they're definitely contrarians. And as soon as you set up a pro-con argument, you have to have someone explaining um, the science of uh, climate change, and then you can have someone say, well, it's not quite true. You know, if you tilt the graph this way, it shows that there's no connection between carbon dioxide and the increasing temperature. And that skews in the public's mind the argument that we should be doing something about climate change. Now, we're not asking scientists to tell us to do that. We're asking the placement of the articles in science as part of a, a pantheon of literature supporting the fact that there is a connection between carbon dioxide and temperature. We're asking the media to interpret that correctly without going to a pro-con method because science doesn't do pro-con. Also the way news, because we're looking at simplifying things, climate science as all the other science, sciences can be very complex. 
And climate science, more than many of the other sciences, is a composite. Uh, we're finding that in, uh, in medicine, for instance. We're also seeing that uh, uh, pharmacology, technology, uh, physics for x-rays, for MRIs, all come in as complex sciences where more basic sciences actually support them. The same thing goes with climate change. In the first series of lectures, I talked about the physics, I talked about the chemistry, I talked about the biology, I talked about the geology and the history, the archaeology of, uh, of climate science. So all of that has to be understood if you're going to write an article about climate change. Opinion plays a large role in almost every climate news report that at some point, you know someone's going to get interviewed. And if it's a visual medium or a sound medium like radio or television, you will see the reporter talking. And none of that actually adds to the story. It's opinion. And so we start to blur the line between the scientific report and an opinion. And when someone is speaking about something and making an interpretation, that comes under the heading of opinion. And newspapers try to be very careful with this, especially the traditional newspapers, um, where they have an opinion page where it's labeled as opinion and you have pundits speaking out. And it's, it can be quite interesting and it can be quite factual, but it's different than interpreting the news. When it comes to science, though, once we start interpreting the opinions of people, even the author who wrote the paper, that skews the veracity of the paper. That's why it doesn't play any part in an academic paper. Another factor in climate science is I doubt that any, anybody in this room other than me reads the actual climate um, reports. I the 3,000 pages of the IPCC was tough to wade through. It's, it's not pleasant reading. I mean, if, if you're looking to fall asleep and you're having trouble sleeping, then I would suggest AR6 from the IPCC is good reading. It'll put you to sleep in just a couple of minutes, but I doubt that anybody reads it other than those who are reporting on it. And so the public relies on the media representation of the climate crisis. This is a really crucial aspect. 99% of all our knowledge as public come from the media and the various echo chambers that go with it. So climate science relies heavily on them. So um, one further fact, uh, when they're teaching in journalism, journalism school or what's called J school, uh, Science is not approached any differently than any of the other branches that someone would report on. Um, some people want to be city reporters, some want to be political reporters, some want to be foreign co correspondents, and they might take a course at most on how to cover the sciences. If you go to King's, there is um, a course that you can take. And once you pass that, you're viewed as having a literacy to report in the sciences. However, if you look at the sciences, the plural, each science is different. And it would be hard to get a physicist to wade into chemistry or a chemist to wade into biology or a biologist to wade into medical biology. Those are very separate academic streams. And, and so when you're interpreting science, if you don't have an expertise in that particular field, you might find it difficult. All, not all sciences are equal. Um, there isn't a recognition that each science requires a different level of expertise. If you're talking about electron tunneling or Schrodinger's cat or quantum physics, that's a completely different skill set than you would have covering the melting of the icebergs in the Arctic. And so in J school, journalistic method from scientific method all the time. Scientific method is viewed as a subset of, of journalistic method. 
So some of the suggested changes, and there have been a lot of studies going on, um, especially over the uh, United States and its coverage of, of climate change. The United States is probably the most covered country in the world when it comes to climate change. What some of the suggestions are is to teach scientists journalism rather than journalists a bit of science, because a little bit of knowledge can be really difficult. The other thing is science has an incredibly low profile in newspapers and in television. You will not, you will see a sports section, you will see a weather section, you'll see an entertainment tonight section in the nightly news, but you won't see a science section. And so as uh, when, when reviewers do the top 10 draws for news shows and television, um, science is nowhere. Weather, by the way, I might add, is the top two. Um, that people want to know what happened today and what's going to happen tomorrow. That is the number one and two. I think sports is number five. I think local politics is number three. Anyway, I have to go through that, but you go down to the top 10, science doesn't make it at all. So the recognition that we have to adapt journalism to science goes right back to what happened with uh, the tobacco lobby. The tobacco lobby actually invented creating doubt and misinterpreting uh, scientific studies in order to keep their product going without restriction. And that has been adopted by a lot of the denialists and doomsayers, and they make a great cottage industry. They're, they've made themselves available to the media in order to get their opinion out. So you can count on a certain group of people always showing up to give you their opinion on, 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 um, on climate change. So the first thing is that we have to modify the pro-con approach. It actually skews it. 97% um, of all scientists and 99% of climatologists um, agree with the literature that shows that human-induced climate change is a reality. That's nowhere near what the public thinks. So um, the pro-con approach actually skews it and makes it seem more likely that people go, well, yeah, I guess there is a little bit of doubt here. Um, because when you present someone who is articulate from a particular lobby um, who has a vested interest and is get funded by the, the Koch brothers or by Exxon Mobil, then they might sway you if you're on the fence or if you don't really understand. The other thing is to delete opinions. We don't need to hear from the author of the report. You have to understand the science in, in um, the papers that I've read in order to interpret it. So you need reporters who are versed in that science to be able to interpret it into journalistic method. Modify the pyramid news reporting style. It is important to have headlines so that people will read it, but at the same time, um, it's difficult to distill something. That's why an abstract is anywhere from 200 to 400 page, uh, words long. It's to give somebody an idea of what you're talking about in an academic paper. Um, you can't distill that into uh, five or six words. Even titles of academic papers are usually 20 to 30 pages long. Delete the spectacle. If it bleeds, it leads. And, and you're seeing that happen right now. We're focusing on the 16,000. We're focusing on the fact that the flames were 200 feet high, that the traffic was jammed, that people uh, can't find their pets. Those are all important stories. But the first part of this, in order to talk about the climate crisis, is to say, that this is related to the climate crisis. It's related to the fact we had the lowest record rainfall ever for April. We had incredibly low snowfall amounts. And if you went out into the woods, at which I have been doing daily for the last 20 years, I've been going to Blue Mountain Birch Cove, you recognize that there's some fundamental changes happening to the soil. It's incredibly dry what soil there is. And of course, it's all laced with 
uh, pine needles and we have predominantly conifer trees and the down trees are loaded time bombs. So we need to get past the spectacle and start incorporating the science of what is going on in our media coverage of the climate crisis. We also have to recognize how science is done and fortify that. We have to place the latest research not as being the best, but actually being part of previous research and showing how it relates to previous research. Or if there are changes, relate the fact that that is scientific method. Science changes when the evidence changes. You want to change a scientist's mind, you do a new study that shows that this is what's happening as opposed to this. If you want to refute um, quantum mechanics and um, Albert Einstein's uh, Nobel Prize of 1905, uh, come up with a better model for figuring out what happens at uh, submolecular levels. And teach that each scientific report is just part of an assemblage. And the methodology fits into that assemblage. So it's possible to change your mind if the evidence changes. In Canadian climate coverage, which is what we're immersed in, um, we're, we're more driven by national and international political events than the changes to carbon emissions. Uh, for instance, we will, I will often hear from people, well, it's the Chinese. I mean, we're just small potatoes compared to them. It's their problem. Of course, we, we covered that. We showed that historically, uh, Western society and per capita, Canada is at the top of the list in terms of its emissions. And this idea that we can offset things, I, I just read a report in the Guardian and looked at the uh, scientific paper that it was based on, China put up more solar panels last year than exist in the United States today. Even though they're building more coal-fired plants, which is also part of a problem, but that speaks volumes, that understanding the complexity of that particular report is important. And some newspapers get it. So, um, we also don't look at government responsibility. Like when we talk of these things happening, and I listen to Mike Savage and in Houston talk about um, you know not doing stupid things. The first question I have to ask is, what were you talking about last week or the week before? So why are we not? Why did we not ever deal with this? That the fact that we're setting up. We've got Blue Mountain Birch Cove, which is going to be over 2,000 hectares of woodland. Uh, and we know more and more people are going there. Why we, would we not look at climate change and try to mitigate that as quickly as possible? Because it's a time bomb. The longer we wait to do something, the more likely it is to happen. And, um, you know, you get different languages from different uh, provinces uh, based on different needs. Um, and there's an increased need to use celebrities, spokespeople. I hear, I was talking to uh, a nascent political party who was interested in my opinion for about 10 minutes until they actually read my, <laughs> my website. Um, well, they hated David Suzuki and they hated those Extinction Rebellion people and the people who from Hollywood who are saying we need to stop the tar sands. He also hated the expression, the tar sands. Celebrity use of things makes people think um, it reinforces individualization as opposed to government action. So the, the Canadian climate coverage has been one that spent a lot of time offloading the responsibility to the individual and not looking at the politicians. So why are we in the position now where we have to ask other provinces to help us put out our own fires, both figuratively and literally? And just a, a couple of graphs. Um, again, I'm going to emphasize 
how different news organizations interpret um, climate change, you get a very small group of climate scientists, roughly on the order of 1%, uh, versus over 70% uh, of the people who watch Fox News denying climate change. And if you look at the, it, this is a, a little harder to see, but if you look at the countries here, um, we are, where are we? We're about the middle, just above the middle part. We have a substantial portion, uh, about half the, the people in Canada believe that even though people play some role in climate change, um, nature plays an almost equal role in it, which is absolutely different than what academia is telling us. The academic papers on climate change are telling us that human-induced climate change is the biggest driver in the changing climate. We've actually peaked as far as the interglacial goes. And sometime over the next 5,000 years, without human intervention, our climate would have begun to cool. It would have finished with its, because of the Milankovitch cycles, uh, it would have finished the interglacial and things would have started to get colder and we'd come to an end of the interglacial uh, and we'd go into another glacial ice age. Well, that didn't happen. And so the natural processes have been completely superseded. And again, that um, just solidifies uh, our confusion. So the United States has been the most widely covered country. And in, in a way, it is also the most criticized country um, in the world because of its dominance. It, it's a democracy still, uh, although some people are saying it's, it's a shaky democracy now. But um, up until recently, almost 80% of all the new climate uh, papers were coming out of the United States and the European Union. Now, other countries are starting to report more, and I'm reading more papers from, um, from China as well. Uh, the Chinese populace actually is more literate in, in the climate crisis than the North American population is. Um, all media are perceived to, see, uh, to be equal with each other. And so when someone watches Fox News and then CBC or PBS, they view the opinions as being equal. Uh, the public doesn't understand the uh, dichotomies, the differences in discourse. So they actually are vulnerable to the misinformation that would come out of Fox News on the climate crisis. And Fox News actually carries that journalistic morality with it and takes advantage of it, um, as do uh, companies like Rebel Media, which Ezra, Ezra Levant uh, heads up. Um, opinion and punditry actually play an outsized role in covering climate change. And again, it makes us think that we have to do something individually as opposed to top down. Like we need laws in place in order to affect the changes in industry and how we build neighborhoods and whether we should be building McMansions in the middle of forests that are vulnerable to forest fire. And none of the journalists locally um, and in virtually all jurisdictions that I've looked at have any formal backgrounds in climate science. I did, um, uh, my dissertation work was in looking across newspapers in Canada. And I was not able to find an expert in, in climate who was a permanent employee reporter on climate in a newspaper. You might get an op-ed happening or a quote happening, but there were no literate climate scientists covering uh, the climate in any of the newspapers that I looked at. Yes? Can you extend that to... Uh... Um, Bob's asking, would I extend that to television media? I think it's recognized in the media that um, the top, there's a hierarchy. 
and the very top is newspaper. And if you if you look at every newsroom that I've worked in, um, and that includes Global CTV, CBC, and uh, Rogers, the first thing they do is pull out newspapers and see what they're covering in order to see what they're going to be presenting. So the hierarchy is such that whatever the newspapers publish, it filters down into all the other mediums and chances are you're going to see the same type of reporting being re uh, uh, reported. Also, what's really difficult for the media and that academics don't have to deal with, and, and, and that's a great question, by the way, Bob, um, is that journalists tend to have to produce a news story in eight hours. If you come in at nine o'clock, you better have it ready on the desk at five o'clock. And that's an excruciatingly difficult thing to do. So you go through your Rolodex and you say, oh, here's my scientist guy or girl or woman or however you want to phrase that person, my scientist. And I'm going to call that particular scientist and get their opinion. And they have to put the story together. If you're in television, you've got to go out with a camera and sound and put it on tape and you've got to write it. I guess they don't do it on tape on a little silicon chip and produce your news story. If you're writing for a newspaper, chances are you might have a day longer, but they don't want you working on something for weeks at a time. They don't have the resources to cover that. So the hierarchy is newspapers and it filters down to all the other uh, media, including electronic media. And when I talk about newspapers, I'm pretty much talking about online newspapers now because all newspapers are um, uh, online now, no matter what. And did you have a question? No, okay. Um, I just saw you in the corner of my eye. Okay, um, are, are there any questions so far? We're just at 20 after, and I think, um, I think we got a, a, we got a couple more slides before we'll break. Be nice. There we go. When you have to talk to your equipment. <laughs> yeah, but I don't, don't get to say what I really want to say. Um, we also recognize the controversy cells. And um, peak media coverage in 2000 and seven was driven by the IPCC fourth assessment report. That was a major event. And so everything peaked at that particular time and Al Gore's presentation of the inconvenient truth. So it's not that climate change wasn't happening before. It's just that this event was the filter through which we looked at climate change. And it, we cover sports all the time. We always, cover the, the, the leaves, and I'm, I'm puzzled why it's not the leaves, um, but that's another discussion. <laughs> uh, since they leave so early, uh, <laughs> that didn't have to be said. Um, we need an excuse to cover climate. We need the controversy. And then a subsequent uh, uh, peak occurred in 2009, which was 50% higher, and it was driven by a combination of factors, the Climate Research Unit email controversy where um, the anti-climate crisis people were saying there was collusion happening. It was a big, huge event. They were suing Michael Mann and Jim Hansen and a number of other um, climate scientists to show, uh, to, to actually uh, besmirch them uh, to make them seem less than credible. And so that got a lot of play, play. So what happens is in climate science, something has to happen in order for us to cover it. Nobody would be talking about the threat of forest fires if we didn't have the largest forest fire in the history of Nova Scotia burning down in Shelburne and the fact that we had to evacuate almost 18,000 people uh, yesterday and the day before, and we still don't know what's going to be the end of that. Um, so controversy sells, and we don't really um, cover science, uh, climate science, unless that controversy is there. There's an ebb and a flow. Um, media attention to climate change and global warming um, ebb and flows according to events that are spectacle related. Um, 
you need a catastrophe to cover. You're not going to cover volcanoes unless one blows up in front of you um, or unless it's got controversy. And so the idea that controversy is necessary in order to sell science is what is important in the news. I remember when I was at CBC in Windsor, Ontario, um, my, I, one of my, uh, my relativistic prof, uh, he wasn't relativistic, but he taught relativity. And I took a third year course from him as an undergrad, um, wrote a book on time. And uh, Dr. Samoshi, uh, who has since passed away, was a wonderfully articulate public represent, representative for relativity. And um, so I wanted to do a story about time and how interesting his perspective was. And I remember arguing with the senior producer who said, no, we're not going to do the story. Um, other than the fact that it's a local person at a university who has written a popular book, but nobody cares about relativity and time. And so without an event, that story wouldn't have happened. We finally got the story up and running. Um, it's, it's really the nature of science in the media. We don't understand as, as, as media, the importance of science and its place in society and how to cover it. So we don't. So controversy is good headlines. And um, <clears throat> Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Accord. We wouldn't be talking about the Paris Accord in 2015, at least it wouldn't have been talked about in the United States unless Trump had withdrawn, and which is kind of bizarre when you think about it. The fact that he withdrew from it and all of a sudden we're gonna talk about climate change. Um, so that, that's just sort of one example. I can think of many other examples, but we just don't have the time. And so climate, because Trump was pillaring climate, climate related events in the news appeared more often because of Trump. And the only news story that was higher was about Trump himself. Because he had spoken about it, that raised the profile of climate science. And it, it immediately twigs in my mind, there's something wrong with this picture. So climate is a vehicle for politicians to get attention and profile. And then all of a sudden, you wind up with a negative, a negative denialist commentary on the climate crisis. And of course, the media was only too happy to accommodate because it is a spectacle that they wanted um, to have because spectacle sells. So on that note, uh, it's 25 after, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll, that was the penultimate um, hour. <laughs> so we have one more hour to go. Anyway, um, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. will double the, the distortion. Secondly, um, by keying in on human interest stories rather than scientific content, they actually distort the nature of the science. The science isn't about the human interest. We are the center of the universe, that's self-acknowledged, but when it comes to science, um, scientists and academicians are saying, we'd like to focus on the science. And thirdly, Journalists distort science by rigid adherence to the construct of balanced coverage. In other words, there's a pro and a con. And if you're very rigid about that, inevitably you're gonna have denialism creep into things. Um, that's not to say, and, and, it was, and Bob pointed it out to me, that there are, in some of our newspapers and some of our media, very adept, scientists who do cover certain things. Um, uh, I know on News 95.7, Dr. Rob Thacker covers, has a, a section on the science files, which started back in 2005 when um, I was with um, Rogers. And there are astronomers who are actual astronomers who report 
uh, on the night sky, that kind of thing. But generally speaking, in a newsroom, there is not going to be a journalist or reporter who has a deep science background in the sciences who is reporting specifically on the sciences. And that's more to the point that I was talking about. Um, the IPCC in 2022 reported that accurate transference of climate science has been undermined significantly by the climate change counter movements. You can read the Koch brothers and the fossil fuel industry in that uh, both, and they call it legacy, uh, which is traditional media and social media environments. And they populate things with misinformation. And that steps outside of journalism, that misinformation. Um, it masks itself uh, to come out as journalism, but it's actually misinformation and doesn't conform to journalistic standards. But it appears in traditional and social media as traditional reporting. So it does a disservice both to journalism and to science. Um, the controversy that we're experiencing is firmly laid at the feet of traditional media and social media nonetheless. Um, and they are responsible for the controversy that exists in the public mind. And if you look at the countries, the United States invented this with the tobacco lobby and various other lobbies. And of course, it goes to Ralph Nader and his book, which we talked about last week, um, Unsafe at Any Speed, about the Corvair. And over 97% of public opinion on the climate crisis comes from the media, not from scientists and science itself. And I have to make clear that it's not the opinion of scientists that I'm interested in. It's actually the science. Uh, opinion is opinion is opinion, whether it comes from a pundit, a denialist, or a scientist. And in order to have an educated populace, there has to be an understanding that the shortcomings of journalism have to be addressed in the coverage of science so that the public can be fully informed. And that comes under the question, how do we teach science journalism in journalism schools? Because those journalists inevitably will be the people that we listen to about the climate crisis. So let's talk about narrative. Um, we focus on um, the controversy versus the science. And again, as I said earlier, um, Trump, is uh, using it to his, as, as the same way that uh, Polyev is, is using his political stance, using climate change as his tool to get higher visibility. Um, it's, it's a tool that's been used over and over again in politics. Human interest, prominence, timeliness, celebrity, and pro, uh, uh, proximity play a significant role. We wouldn't be talking about forest fires in the relationship to the climate crisis unless HRM and Nova Scotia was burning. We would read about it uh, out West uh, and think, oh, I'm glad I don't live in Kelowna or um, the parts that are burning up in British Columbia and Alberta. But now that it's on our doorstep, all of a sudden the climate crisis is something that we want to talk about. Um, the personalization, the stories that come out, while they're an important part of journalism, overshadow the climate crisis itself. And so when we talk about the, I remember, and, and I, I thought this was incredible, uh, this woman who res rescued 18 dogs by storming through the woods to get at the dogs that she had on her property to get them out um, is incredible. It's a human interest story. But it, if, if that is the only reporting or the bulk of the reporting that we start to read, that changes the narrative. Um, it's the same way as when Tesla tells you about their new ultra fast car and it can go zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 1.9 seconds, you're not talking about the efficacy of the electric car. You're talking about something that is spectacle-based. 
Um, yes, it's talking about Tesla, but it's oriented towards selling Tesla. But it's not asking the question, should we be driving electric cars? Should we have more public transit? That kind of thing. And that's the kind of thing that we need to step away from, this personalization of it. A lot of people like to buy cars because they're fast. Uh, you, you have a, a car with a Porsche label on the front. You carry a certain amount of cachet um, if you need that kind of thing. Um, the tendency um, for big social, economic, or political pictures uh, in favor of human trials, tragedies, and triumphs is really a shortcoming of how uh, we cover the, the climate crisis. Hmm. There we go. The culture of political journalism has long used the notion of balanced coverage in covering controversy. In this construct, it is permissible to air a highly partisan op opinion, provided this view is accompanied by a competing um, opinion. So you can, in the pre present uh, pre presentation of a climate crisis issue, you can increase the polarization by who you choose to comment. And by bringing opinion in, um, you can broaden that perspective. And one of the things we talked about a couple of lectures ago is how broad the perspective is in the United States between those who think that the climate crisis is happening, who agree with the scientific literature, and those that don't, is more polarized in the United States than in any other country. And it's this bringing in of individuals to support those polarizations, which add to the polarization. So it's, it's acceptable to do that, as long as you have a competing opinion. Um, it's always throwing the ball up in the air as far as is the climate crisis real when you have those debates. And you never get away from it. You never get to the point where, what are we going to do with it? Because we're debating about whether it happens. And we do the same thing with uh, much of the uh, amelioration of the climate crisis. Do I buy carbon credits or do I agree with having carbon taxes? And we never look at the nuts and bolts of it as to what the outcome is and what the outcome might be and what it has been proven to be, we keep debating it back and forth. And we get um, right-wing groups saying we should have um, carbon credits because it requires not doing anything right now. And I get to fly and I get to drive my pickup truck and lead a carbon intensive uh, lifestyle because um, I can just throw a little bit of money towards uh, a carbon credit and feel good about it. But in actual fact, it doesn't lower the amount of carbon dioxide. Um, so recently scientists have been looking at this and scholars have challenged the legitimacy of this journalistic core value with regard to matters of great importance and saying, do we need to change journalistic method um, when the majority of the scientific communities research shows a particular outcome that we're not following. So why are we not following it? And of course that comes from the media because that's not reported. Um, the distorting of science. Two scholars did a review of 600 and some odd articles. Um, from four top US newspapers between 88 and 1988, which is back in the Stone Age, according to many people, and 2002. And they found that most articles give as much time to a small group of climate change doubters as to scientific consensus. And I would say that in hardcore science coverage of, of the climate crisis, that still exists to a large degree. You'll still have quotes. Um, it presents over and over again the argument that if we're 
in discussion of something, we're actually doing something. And this idea of trying to iron out what the truth is through opposing polarizations makes people, people feel that they're doing something valuable. But this isn't 1960 or 1970 anymore. We don't have the luxury of doing that. And so many scientists are saying that this mainstream consensus of debating what we should be doing or having people call in on the CBC News show about um, what they're doing to combat climate change is not the right perspective. Today's uh, call-in was about that, by the way, where they had young people saying, what should we be doing, as opposed to saying, why are we not doing it to the politicians? And so it's been offloaded onto the young people now, where they feel that they have to be telling us something, or they feel they have to be doing something. So this media argument that's been set up for them is the wrong argument. It's not about whether we should be discussing what I as an individual should be doing, but what our elected officials should be putting in place to help us achieve those goals. And why are we in this position? And then it comes down to what is balanced. It doesn't mean giving equal weight to both sides of an argument. That's really the simple, cheap way of doing it, a pro and a con. It means supporting weight according to the balance of evidence. And this is where we come to understanding the science. So if a reporter or journalist is reading a scientific paper, when they get to the discussion part of the paper, before they get to the conclusion, they will talk about the error bounds. How certain are the results of this study and how does it fit into all the other uh, studies that have been done before it and the body of work that relates to it. You have to understand what that means as a reporter. When somebody says it's likely to happen, some people interpret it saying, well, it's likely that it may not happen then, that it may not in fact happen. And if that's the case, why aren't we discussing it? And that is not the intent of the academic paper. The intent of the academic paper is to say, the support of this particular article is bounded by these particular events. It is bounded by um, these particular constraints and we're taking this in, in, into consideration, but we can't quantify it. And we can't really qualify it the way we would like to. So there's a certain amount of error in here. It doesn't mean that the entire thing is wrong. The issue of extremism comes from the United States principally. Um, many of the media deliberately seek out extreme views in order to give you that balance. This can result in the portrayal of risks well beyond the claims made by scientists. So reporters will exaggerate things. If somebody is saying uh, the ice sheet melt by 2100 is likely to give us um, two meters of additional uh, sea levels through thermal expansion and the addition of water from the melting ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica um, with an error bound that may be 30%. Uh, you may see in the media saying, oh, so we're gonna get three meters of flooding or more. And what it, you, you may get the question as a, as a scientist where a reporter would ask, so what's the worst case scenario? And that's what's being reported on. So the polarization is something that terrifies people. So you, you start reading those types of things. Journalists tend to overemphasize the most extreme outcomes. Um, it's, uh, well, we saw that with um, the COVID uh, crisis where, um, there, there was a lot of blowback because some people got ill after receiving vaccinations, even though it was such a minuscule number that did. Um, and the chances of 
getting infected with COVID and deleterious effects to your health were much greater getting COVID than from the vaccinations. Yet it was reported along with the COVID um, crisis that uh, vaccinations have risk. Why it was necessary to report, um, I question. The extremeness of the report um, in terms of the efficacy of, the, of vaccines is another thing that I would question. And without the understanding of medical science, a reporter and the editor and the publisher wouldn't have a way of parsing that information properly. Um, the results and conclusions of, of studies are widely misrepresented by the media um, to make the uh, catastrophe seem worse than they are. And that's the long and the short of it in science. And if you don't understand the science, it's likely you don't get blowback from it. You can say pretty much anything you want, how many scientists are listening to your news report. And it also alienates scientists when this happens. And I've, I've had, um, as, as I was reporting on sciences, uh, many scientists refuse to speak to the media because they feel they'll be misrepresented or their studies will be misrepresented or they'll be asked questions that have nothing to do with the study and they don't feel comfortable uh, talking to the media. So this kind of set up questioning in order to get the information is often skewed by the need, need of the media for extreme perspectives. Um, there's also, um, on the flip side, uh, many of the universities have taken to getting press releases in, um, and the press releases are what reporters are picking up on and reporting on that. And press releases are interpreted by PR people who often don't have a background even in journalism. They're skilled in the rhetorical arts. And so press coverage is uh, an issue when reporters base their scientific reports and stories on uh, press releases. Um, newspapers tend to give greater coverage to press releases that oppose the action of climate change than those that support action. Um, that's a false balance. And um, people's partisan preference is an indicator as to which media outlet they will look at. In other words, if you're Republican, chances are you're not going to be listening to PBS. That tends not to be, um, or you're not going to be reading the uh, uh, Guardian in London or the Times, although both of them in the past have had questionable coverage of the climate crisis, but they're getting much better. Um, and media outlets, for instance, the Globe and Mail is seen to be a conservative newspaper, even though it reports the news and it does a good job reporting news. And the Toronto Star and its group of papers is seen as being a liberal paper. So people align themselves with the media that they want their information from. If you agree with the editorials of the Globe and Mail, chances are you'll read it. Chances are you'll also have a conservative bent since it's a conservative paper. If you go the extreme conservative, then you'll read the National Post, um, which is uh, something we'll talk about in a minute. Bless you. Um, or Gesundheit, whichever the case may be. If um, media crew, <laughs> however, all that having been said is that media coverage is crucial. Um, the significant, uh, the, the role of the media is significant in our understanding of climate policy. And we have to get media back on track as quickly as possible in order to get to the point where we're dealing with things and asking the right questions. Uh, it has a considerable uh, uh, bearing on public opinion and the way issues are reported or framed establishes particular discourses. And um, politics, this is a big one. 
the relationship between the media and poli politics is reflexive. Uh, it's how it got started. It was only in the 1920s in the United States that the newspaper started to drift away a bit from being totally partisan um, in their reporting. Discourse has material and, and, and powerful effects as being the effect of material practices and power relations. In other words, what you write about influences how people behave and hence um, influences in elections. You have countries that are very adept at pointing out weaknesses uh, like Russia infiltrates uh, election processes and democracies and skews them. Um, and that happens on social media and it's picked up in traditional media as well. So the discourses that they set up are what we talk about. We don't even know we're talking about the wrong thing when it comes to the climate crisis. It's when we talk about forest fires, again, to go back to that example, it's one thing to talk about the, the human tragedy of it, but it's another thing when the climate crisis relationship to it is listed so far down. It skews how people pick up on it. And people deliberately set up that kind of narrative for whatever their interests might be. And if it's funded by fossil fuels, so much the better for keeping people's minds off the climate crisis. How people perceive science is how they vote, and often that determines the funding. This is a big, big circle. And funding for research can be tenuous. And determining what type of research you're doing really depends on, can I get money for it? Can I get my advisor to agree to this? Can I get, will this be something that advances someone's career? And what is the public support for it? Universities look at that. They can't help but look at that. That's an important part of how universities function is to get the funding to do research, but public opinion plays into it. Public opinion is really important. And if you're doing research in something that's not pop popular, that's going against public um, perception, then you might not be able to do the research in that particular field. Institutions, whether you like it or not, often have political leanings. They fund particular political parties for a particular agenda, and they let people know um, who are in uh, positions of power within the media that they want things a certain way. As I said, I, I had an interview with a certain party and uh, a political party that's starting up in the West um, who thought, I might be an interesting candidate before they read my um, Facebook and, and web page, but they had a certain political mindset and they didn't want to hear anything. So I all of a sudden became disenfranchised and a persona non grata. It's not, I'm not somebody they want to talk to. And they realized it too late. They wasted 20 minutes talking to me. Um, so these political leanings are important in how the media uh, puts in information, biases information, changes balances, has an effect on public opinion, which again feeds back into what we actually study. Um, good example um, is uh, women's health. For a, a long time, most of the heart health studies back in, 30, 40 years ago, were done on men, not women. It was just assumed that whatever happened to men would happen to women. There's a certain bias. And at that particular time, there wouldn't, would probably have not have been the same ratio of uh, female to male doctors who would have wanted to do those studies. And so it might also not have been popular to do those studies. And certainly the media wouldn't have reflected that. They wouldn't have had the wherewithal to reflect that. So those kind of politics come into play. So how do you fix it? Okay, so all the kvetching and, and whining and sniveling, renting of hair, gnashing of teeth, uh, weeping and wailing, um, to quote somebody. Um, I think it was the Goon show that uh, quoted that, um, that said it originally. Um, so the conversations 
have not been conducive to doing something. The conversations have been self-fulfilling. In other words, the communications have been about communications instead of actions. So we need to break the pre prevailing notions in society. Um, and the conventions that it is traditionally appropriate and approachable to common people. Sometimes we have to get loud, that we have to assert that when the science tells us to do something, we need to follow that and not debate it. Bill McKibben, who um, is one of the people that I recommend highly, and I put him on the book list, who is an environmental act activist, says we need to get on a warlike footing. We need to get the media to recognize this. And we did that once, almost, uh, I guess it's 80 years ago. We got onto a war footing in the Second World War and we changed our lives and we changed the outcome of what might have been an entirely fascist uh, block in Europe and possibly the United States and maybe even Canada. So if we get on a war footing, how does that take place? How do we get there? How can the media help us? Well, social media um, has worked against us. Um, it hasn't been around long enough for us to do a whole lot of studies about it. It is right now working against us, uh, platforms like Twitter, and I don't even know half the, the platforms that are out there are a fraction of the platforms that people communicate in. I have no idea what a TikTok is. Uh, other than my clock used to do that, keep me up at night. Um, so the studies on social me media need to be done. They're, they're quite influential. Um, there are many people that rely on YouTube videos for their information, um, and they can be incredibly biased. Um, and people on social media tend to join the groups that they feel comfortable with, very similar to how people watch their news or read their newspapers. They ascribe to those particular papers that um, have a, a feedback echo chamber that reflects their sense of values. And studies show that social media can have both negative and positive impacts on the information sharing of issues related to climate change. So the social media needs to be studied um, now, Canadian journalists to avoid, we'll just do a quick primer here. These are the ones that have driven me to distraction over the years. Terence Corcoran used to write for the Globe and Mail, and he was a vociferous climate change denier. Um, and he just went on and on and on. He was a business columnist uh, saying that we have to let capitalism have free reign. And, uh, you know, if it's uh, not capitalistic, uh, libertarian perspectives, then we shouldn't be doing it. He went on to be, uh, become the business editor at Conrad Black's National Post, where he still holds that position. And you can still read his writings on climate denial. Um, he says Kyoto is dead, that the anti-Kyoto Asia Pacific partnership is perfectly uh, perfectly reasonable alternative and he says Kyoto is too expensive and this goes back a long time Kyoto was I believe 1995 um, he's probably the most prominent and effective roadblock to good climate policy in Canada uh, this comes from dsmog blog and I've edited it down um, another person Does anybody have a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Our good friend Rex Murphy. For someone who's a Rhodes Scholar with a brain pan that's bigger than mine, um, I'm so disappointed. He is probably the most famous. I mean, he was on CBC Cross Country. It wasn't Cross Country Checkup. Was it Cross Country Checkup? Yeah. Um, I, I used to love listening to him. He's erudite, uh, funny, but he, he is a, a dissident when it comes to 
uh, the climate crisis. If you hear something from him, um, it's chances are if it's related to climate change, it's conspiracy laden. Um, his talk is irresponsible. He had such and continues to have such sway in Canadian uh, politics uh, with his perspectives. Um, it's 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 really disappointing. Uh, I I wanted to like Rex Murphy <laughs> because he's a smart guy, and what's not to like about intelligence? But I guess it's as someone said, the gelt uh, that uh, that comes through and is the motivating factor. Okay. I guess that is my question. Um, what would the motivating factor be for both these uh, people? Uh, you say they're intelligent. Uh, they're... So what, what is it that's swaying them? What is it that one person would see a wallet on the, on the floor, pick it up and give it back to its owner? Or another person would pick it up, take the money and throw the wallet in the river? Um, smart people are just as vulnerable, I think, to the vices that we attribute to um, humanity overall. And they have platforms. And sometimes when you have a platform, you're isolated and you don't really realize. I, that is a worthy question of study. I, I really would like to know that. What I mean, we went through some notables last lecture, like Bjorn Lomberg and um, a number of other, and, and uh, Tim Ball. Why an academic would want to crush their career with ridicule by becoming a climate denier? I I, I don't understand. It's a fabulous question. If anybody has an answer to that, um, I, I think there's a paper or a book or something in that. By Koch brothers, or oh, the, the question was, uh, why would someone do this, and are they getting back back by the Koch brothers? Probably money is a great motivator. Um, you know, we are greedy little things when it comes down to it. You just have to look at what families will do, um, fighting each other for bits and pieces of money when a will is being read. Um, it's uh, it, it's a mystery to me how that gets corrupted. Uh, I, I would think money plays a, a big role, but I, I don't know. Rex Murphy, I believe, is from Newfoundland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... Uh... Yeah, can you increase the profile, the individual's profile? Well, the question is, is it, uh, first of all, Rex is, is a Newfoundlander, I, I believe. And is it about increased profile? I guess um, it's it's a quick way of doing it. Uh, it's never occurred to me to become a climate denier and and call up Charles Koch and say, "Listen, for a million bucks, I can, I can." For, it's a lot of shekels, but uh, that would make my retirement fund that a little more cozy. Um, and certainly, um, maybe. Uh, I'll just finish this list here. It, it's a short list. And maybe we can gain some insight from that. So um, the next one on the list is Ezra Levant. And he's, for a while, was the most famous climate denier. He's a national broadcaster, columnist, and author. And he railed against science in general. Um, he's, again, like a noble dissident. Um, one of the few voices of reason in the rising course uh, of climate crisis mitigation. Um, you know, I, listening to him, he's even a more extreme. Oh, that's Rex Murphy. No, that's Ezra Levant. Sorry. Goodness. There we go. Ezra Levant holds a commerce degree from the University of Calgary, a former law degree from the University of Alberta. Um, he faced disciplinary charges. I, I think he was kind of broken to begin with. Uh, not that I have anything against lawyers, uh, but someone who was disbarred, uh, I, I would have to think, has uh, malleable scruples. 
Um, he does have his own um, uh, news organization, Rebel Media, and he has a need for the profile. And he's articulate. He's in the, in the same mold as uh, Terrence Corcoran. And he's articulate and, and shoots from the hip and is compelling to listen to. Unfortunately, most of what he says is bull feathers. Um, according to, the, uh, to a search of the Office of the Commissioner of Lobbying of Canada from 2009 and two, until 2010, he worked for a lobby as a lobbyist for Rothmans Incorporated. So I, I would guess there's some money involved in that. Um, and last on the list, it's not just the boys that are bad. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever listened to Faith Goldie's reports, but she worked for Rebel Media until she was fired from Rebel Media for being too controversial. Um, she's uh, she's quite a racist. She's a white supremacist and speaks out against uh, Jews and has this term of the Jewish question. Uh, which I have not heard since uh, Heydrich uh, posed that to uh, the Nazis, solving the Jewish question. Um, she was uh, broadcasting about white nationalists, she called them patriots, when uh, a car rammed the protesters behind her, and she didn't miss a beat, um, just continued on. And um, she's a vociferous spokesperson for virtually all libertarian causes. And all these people are contrarians. And that's what they have in common. So maybe there's a thread there for the research. If you're asking why they do it, I don't understand. Um, I'd love to sit down and think that uh, some reasonable discourse would change their minds. But uh, obviously, that hasn't been the case. And um, I'll just take a, uh, just, this is the last slide. This is, uh, during the Harper government times, Canadian media, most notably the CBC, made a little effort to balance the claims of the global warming deniers with voices from science. And we have our own um, problems even with our public broadcaster with what is embedded in the public broadcasting system. We just don't get science. And the media that is the glue to hold us together as a society um, is, is fraying in, in many ways around the edges. And it's fraying because of uh, hyper-capitalism and funding by uh, various groups like the Koch brothers and the fossil fuel lobby through pseudo organizations and people who are willing participants to skew things to the media and the media doesn't understand science to the degree that it needs to and needs to modify um, journalistic methods so that they can cover science in a more equitable manner. And there's lots of work out there that, that points to that. And that could be a 12 hour course. Um, that wraps it up for me. I would like to say thank you to SCANS. Thank you to all that turned out, not only in person, but on the internet in this hybrid version. This was just amazing to be able to sit down and talk to you about something that's so important to all of us and something that I've been talking about for 40 years. And I apologize if I've been too strident but I, I don't know any other way to be. So that, that's the way it is. And um, there's kind of a, a Groucho Marxian perspective to this of not wanting to be part of a group that would have such low standards as to let you lecture to them. Um, so it's, it, you're a wonderful group and thank you so much. And I hope this helps you understand things. Oh, okay. So Bob tells me you have a question. Yeah, hopefully. Am I, I'm not sure if I'm coming through. Uh, do we need more emphasis on vested financial interest by 
uh, income from advertisers as well as pipelines. Yeah. Um, we need uh, a list of lobbyists for various organizations. We need uh, to know who's doing the talking, who's funding them, and who they're representing. So yes, I do agree that laws have to be tightened up. And so much of what's hurting us is misinformation. And it's it's stopping us from acting. And that's why I, I, I ended with the media. This is crucial. We need all brains thinking about um, getting the media online, not only with the uh, the tragedies of things and the spectacle of things, but when we report on that, report the underlying science so that everybody will understand what the motivation for what's happening to us is. Any other questions? Oh, <laughs> yes, sir. Don't, don't, Hi, Robert. Don't you think that based on what we talked about the last six weeks of a total control by the politicians and and capitalism that is really it's really coming down to millennials getting actively involved in their communities and you can't do change these issues that much at the local level they're truly international somewhat maybe but our millennials need to get involved in politics. Now, if, if it's the if it's the political change that we require, and maybe it's the millennial generation, and even the generation Z that's behind them that they're not even voting age yet, that seem to recognize this issue more than you know our generation recognizes it, but we're getting too tired <laughs> so I, I, you know it's probably the millennial generation and the generation after that that needs to get involved in the community get involved politically and because they need to, it's their world it's going to be their world it's not ours you're right so, anyway, uh, that, the question that bob post is uh, um, uh, posed is millennials need to get involved politically so because we're politically active, the older generation, it's incumbent upon us to introduce the millennial, millennials, millennials to the political process. It's a hard process to get into, and it's a school of hard knocks in many ways. And so what you're doing right now is the start, but each one of us needs to encompass at least one millennial and bring them into the political process. I, I think it's crucial that uh, they get involved. It's actually, as I said before, my future is this big, and I've got two small fingers up. A millennial future is this big, and I've got my arms stretched wide. So I agree with you totally. Um, I, I think the solution is to uh, look at bringing them into the fold and, and use whatever methods we can to, to bring them in. And not just pat them on the head. I saw a lot of that going on when young people would come into council and talk about the climate crisis. We would be patronizing. We would pat them on the head and say, how nice, how cute, and not do anything. And voting is one of the most powerful methods that seems to escape people. And by not voting, I think we're hurting ourselves and not getting politically involved. Um, you and then you? Okay. Perhaps we could uh, challenge you to write a textbook for junior high children to be put in the schools. Maybe that would help. That's well, it, it's, I, I think, I don't know about textbooks. It's really hard to break into Addison Wesley and the textbook market and all that. And there's really, um, I am using this template for my next book. So what I've lectured on will be a book this year. And if Leslie Choice hasn't fallen out with me yet for not writing the bloody thing, um, I'm hoping that Pottersfield Press will, will publish it. So I will be writing a book about this. And of course, I will be talking about what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, I think that's uh, an important area because I have two daughters who are two children and they talk to me about what 
what they're seeing with their students and how they can bring into their classroom uh, these awarenesses. So um, I think that that's, again, the individuals, if you have a uh, position of any kind that can um, foster yeah. that information and it needs to be information. And my, my grandson right now is uh, being homeschooled, but what they're learning, what he's learning is important elements about uh, the environment and about the water situation. And these are things that um, it, there needs to be a much greater awareness in our school system. And I think that that comes from with the individual teachers, wherever they can, because there is a lot of opportunity for them to, uh, to bring that information. Again, it's information not just uh, you know pictures and bias and you know but to get that information to the kids in a meeting. So that's just my thought. Yeah, and 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 basically education is such an important constituent. Stuart, did you have a, a question? Uh, a comment. First of all, thank you, Richard, for a splendid series. Uh, you talked appropriately about the shortcomings of the media, but you only briefly mentioned the role of scientists in all of this. You said that scientists are reluctant sometimes to talk to journalists for fear that their studies will be misreported, but there's more to it than that. They also potentially suffer um, disrespect to their colleagues. Um, in academe, speaking to the media is perceived sometimes as pandering to the public opinion, and they, they lose respect among their colleagues sometimes. Moreover, scientists are not trained in how to deal with journalists, just as journalists are not trained how to understand science. And finally, scientists uh, often fear public backlash with media presence, social media. If you come out and make a statement about your research, you'll get a raft of really wicked invective from people who misinformed, uh, disagree with what you have to say. It's very personal. So the scientists are also part of the problem when they're not reluctant, when they're not engaged with the media to tell the story appropriately. I, I think that's an excellent point, Stuart. Um, uh, so, so Stuart, Cam Dr. Stuart Cameron was um, just pointing out that uh, uh, scientists do do bear some of the responsibility, and there's a large group of scientists who say, "I'm a scientist. It's not my responsibility to put this information out there. That's your job." And by the way, I'm not interested in helping you. I'm just going to do my research. We are all in this together, and that is, as I said before, I could do a 24-hour lecture series on on the climate crisis, not just a 12-hour lecture series. And that's an important point. Um, as someone who has done research and is involved in research, it's difficult to look at the shortcomings of my own field, although I'm, I am a journalist as well. Um, it's easier to cast stones at someone else, quite frankly. Um, and, and so scientists also bear a lot of the responsibility. And now that we're seeing equality happen in the sciences. There's another aspect which relates directly to what you were saying, Stuart, is that if you're a woman and you choose to speak out, the vitriol that happens on social media steps up orders of magnitude and, and women scientists are commenting on it. And, and some of it uh, is, is almost drives people, uh, makes people suicidal. It, it's just horrible, horrible stuff. And these things we need to rein in. We need to teach our scientists. And, and this is something that I'm hoping that uh, uh, Dalhousie will do, is to teach all scientists that part of being a scientist is understanding how to communicate. It shouldn't just rest on the shoulders of a few and Stuart, you've spent your entire career, both in medicine and in the media, and balancing those, as I have. There aren't many people who do that, and, and justifiably so. Uh, Carl Sagan talked about the ridicule. You're not a real scientist because you popularize it. Same things happened to David Suzuki. He's a, a scapegoat for a lot of, he's not a real scientist, but he's a world-class geneticist. <laughs> You know, that's what he did his work in. Um, and many other, many other scientists um, 
feel the same thing that when they get into the media. So good point. Um, I should have covered that in a little more depth. Yes. I had a question for Ian Johnson. Just to, I think there's another aspect of this. And thank you, Stuart, for your comments. But I think there's another aspect of this in terms of environmental positivism, looking at environmentalism from another perspective, which is to bring out the company Earth Day and all the movements that go with that. I think it's a whole other approach to emphasize right. the positive aspects of what environmental approaches and, and means could do for us. <sighs> There are so many offshoots to this. So when I, and, and the question really came around, that's being asked um, is, is there not a role for looking at the positive groups that um, Earth Day, um, Oceans Day, which bring people together to celebrate our ecosystem and environment, which is dependent on uh, the climate crisis or is going to be affected by the climate crisis. Those things um, are have been studied and have been shown to have a positive effect. So that um, it certainly could have been part of the lecture series as well. Yes. Uh, there's a, a Catherine Hagel, who's a, a Canadian who's in the United States, a climatologist. And she says, uh, when asked, um, what can we do? Talk about it, she says. And I found recently uh, when we get um, Climatologists, geologists, biologists uh, to talk about uh, um, what they see. And uh, it's, it's difficult to get a scientist to talk emotionally, but when they say, I see the ice cap melting, I see the species depleting, I see the incidence of disease going up, I think that has a, an impact on people that they can understand. It, it's not throwing the science in their face, but it's saying, you know, I've, I've uh, devoted my life to this aspect of science and I see things are going bad and I'm just telling you, and uh, perhaps that's when the people can move the politicians after they hear the, the story of how things are going. So science has a role to tell their story uh, in that way, I think. Uh, I think that uh, you're correct. Scientists do need to tell their story. They need to learn, as Stuart said, how to speak to the media, how to speak to the public, not just in, in lecture halls. Uh, they need to participate. And, and I'll give you just one little anecdote. In my first year as counselor, um, I, I noted at the beginning of April, there was World Scientist Day. So I reserved Grand Parade and we publicized it and we sent it out to all the universities. I think 25 scientists showed up and 100 people of the public showed up. Um, there isn't the recognition that science is important publicly yet. And, and so, yes, you're right. We have to get involved. We have to use all the tools at our disposal um, to be able to do this and cover it. We don't know what's going to be effective until we try it. So I, I take it that's it. And we've probably run out of time. Okay. And no, thank you all. <laughs>